Happy, happy Sunday. A Sunday, which I normally don't do, but only when I need to and I feel it's appropriate for our special people that we love and adore in the music industry. Come on, everybody. Come on in. It's time to get comfortable on a Sunday. I know the dinners are over. That's why we went 7 o'clock. Roasts are put away. Stuff's put in the refrigerator. Children may be tucked into bed for school. Those who are going to school tomorrow. And it's time for the parents to relive their youth and their fun times through our shows, which we do each and every week. But tonight's a more special show, and you'll see why in one moment. Welcome to True House Stories. I am Lenny Fontana coming out of New York City on a special Sunday night edition for everyone to check out. I was blessed to have this performer diva agree to come on to our show. Um, it happened with some friends of mine who work with me. They all got together recently at, in Brighton and they were speaking about my show and they mentioned, hey, you have to do Lenny's show, True Our Stories. And this diva said, yeah, I'll do it. I know Lenny, I know Lenny, yeah. Anyway, I want to tell you who this diva is. Her voice has been sampled more than more than I can even count on some of the biggest records of all time. Even the Black Eyed Bees, Bees took her voice and boom, boom, pow. And she has been touring the world with Happy Mondays as the lead singer and as well, Rowetta, those that know the name Rowetta. She herself is a force to be, to be, to be played around. Try playing around with her. She'll call you out. Trust me in a moment. She'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so no longer holding back because we want to get right into the story. We like to welcome to the stage Rowetta from the UK. Hi. <laughs> hey Rowetta, happy Sunday and happy Mondays. Happy Sunday, girl. Thank you for doing thank you. Thank you oh, for thank you for having me. Thank you so much. I have to say I'm the co-singer in Happy Mondays because I joined them. They're a boy band. I joined them. I'm the girl singer, but um, Sean is very much the lead singer. Oh, when I, I say them. lead singer, yeah. fem- I actually said female. Yeah, lead lead, exactly. Yeah, that's it. I just hate anybody saying backing singer because people automatically think you're a backing singer because you're a black girl. And I have to tell people out, honestly, you wouldn't believe how many people they will interview me. Then they'll say backing singer Rowetta. And I just say, you might as well say blacking singer. Really annoys me. Don't presume I'm a backing singer. I've never been a backing singer. Nothing wrong with being a backing singer, but I'm not one. I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm just not a backing, I back, and my, back myself sometimes. But um, yeah, I don't mind doing backing vocals sometimes, but I'm not a backing singer. Well, I didn't say Ooh. backing singer. I said front lead singer. I did say you, that. No, so. you didn't. I know. I'm just, I just, in case any Happy Mondays fans think I'm saying I'm the, the lead, um, I do it with Sean and I love singing with the band and have done for 31 years now. Yes. I oh, know, thank you. <laughs> Three decades of fine excellence there. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you again for coming on on a Sunday oh, edition. Thank you for having me. Special Sunday. I, I've done Sundays with Carl Cox, Danny Teneglia. A few of the Sundays have been where we fit certain people we think need to have that special day oh, to share their story. And this is the right time of night because, you know, clubbing is over from Saturday night, people are home. It's a good time of night to start. So before we even get into your first question, we want to ask you, how has the COVID era been for you, you know, from lockdown and then it opening back up? How have you coped with everything? I I didn't cope well at all. I did at first. I thought, I'm used to being on my own. I can handle this. Um, I, I, I like the peace and quiet a bit. Um, I've, I've toured, I've just done a 30 day tour with Happy Mondays. So I was enjoying like having a little bit of time at home and quiet without anybody bothering, having selfies all the time, this thing where everyone wants a picture with you when we've been on tour. So I was enjoying it. And then, then there came a bit of a lull and, um, I just really miss doing gigs and seeing people. But then a lot of the DJs and producers that are normally traveling around the world, they were in lockdown too. So they were saying, hey, do you want to work together? People who, are, you know, we said we'd work together, Salado, Oliver Heldens. It never happened because they're always away. People like that and Todd Terry over there. There was a lot of people that all of a sudden had loads of time at home 
So I did loads of writing and collaborating with people. I have a studio at home. So I thought, this lockdown's amazing. This is great for getting creative because I can do all the technical stuff myself and record myself. Thank goodness Bless I learned. You. Yeah, thank goodness you. I learned how to do it. Ooh. It saves me. Saved me. So I was able to send my vocals all over the place and write stuff with people I wouldn't normally because some we're too busy, or they're too busy. And then after a while, it was just when I think everything was supposed to open up and I was seeing America was opening up a little bit. And some of the DJs, my friend Salado went over to America and they were gigging and there were no gigs here. And then I really hit almost rock bottom because these, the government said they were opening up. We were going to be able to fly and travel again. And then it said, they said no again. And singers and clubs and everything I do in venues, theatres, were the last, going to be the last to reopen. And I started to get very, very low, like the lowest. I don't get depressed, really. I've, I've not had a great life in sometimes in my personal life. But I never felt as low as you, when you can't see an end to it. I've not felt this low for years um, because I couldn't see an end to it. And, yeah, I was, I was really almost at rock bottom. I was getting number ones in Beatport and stuff with DJs. But it's, I, stopped, I stopped caring. I think me and Oliver Heldens were getting three million hits on Spotify. Things like that don't bother you when you can't come out of your house and sing on a stage. Singing on a stage, I didn't realise how important it was to me. The DJs all started to get be getting out a bit and playing in Ibiza, but they weren't going to let singers sing and over here and in Ibiza, and it killed me. I went to Ibiza, I was supposed to do a gig, and then they said, no, it will encourage people to dance, and dancing was banned in Ibiza. So my life felt like it was over. My kids had grown, you know, and I, I thought I was enjoying this lockdown, but there's only so many collaborations you can do without going performing them out, you know, or hearing them in, on, a, on a da- with a dance floor with people listening. And... When, when you're doing house music, you want to, people to dance. You know, um, I've, I've done some great collaborations during the lockdown, but there were no clubs open to play them. So you're relying on people playing them on the radio shows, which is great. And then I'd record them, you know, and put them, put them up on my acting like I'm really happy on Instagram and everything. You're posting them up and going, yeah, isn't, yes. that tough? isn't that tough yeah. to do that? Is it tough? It's awful. I mean, I love it. Clapton's played my tune. David Getz has played my tune. And you're posting it up. But that became all I had. There was nothing else, just writing, singing, and doing that, but the performing. Oh, my goodness me. I missed it so, so much. And my mum living not far from me and my son, taking him to work every day as I did, it didn't, it's, it's why I didn't go mad and I've got dogs. But really, I needed my life back. And um, like everybody needed the life back. But when you're a performer of any kind and you can't see an end to it, it oh, it was, it was cruel. But we're back now. And amazing about doing arena tour with the Happy Mondays. I've done quite a lot of house um, gigs and house music gigs, a lot of private events, and we've done just done a load of festivals. And it's um, it's not like it's never happened though. It's still we've all got to be tested or vaccinated before to do the gigs and things. But it's so good to be back and have audiences back because that's my high an audience. That's when I started singing when I was a kid. That's what I became almost addicted to that buzz when people when people scream and say they want more or, or they say they get goosebumps from my voice. There's no feeling like it. And, you know, I don't want to be walking around shops singing to people, but that's it was getting a bit like that, you know, where, where I'm singing down the phone to people's mums because that was giving me that little buzz I need. And um, I wasn't going to do loads of videos of me singing on online because it, it, I just thought that looked a bit rubbish, to be honest. Too many people were singing to camera all the time. That's a need for a different kind of audience, I think, needs to be heard all the time. I'm not that kind of singer. I like that buzz of actually real people dancing, singing, uh, get, just moving, loving the music. I just love all that. And but that's a it. hardship, what happens when you finally just realize you really don't have any control over the situation. Where they pull the root, they pull the rug out from under you, and now you're at a point where you're uh, stuck to the situation around you where none of us could go anywhere. We're all isolated. But to hear that you were able to, to work with, to collaborate and you know how to work a studio stuff that makes it that much easier. This is a lot of people that don't know how to do that stuff. Singers. They should have learned then. In lo- that was your time to learn. You can order your equipment and learn. Luckily, I, I decided to learn because I wasn't happy when you're having to wait for studios to be open and when somebody wants a vocal straight away. 
And I just thought I need to learn and get better. I need to buy, I was buying microphones that weren't quite right and not getting my room soundproofed the right way. And now my, my bedroom, I can wake up in the morning and have my microphone next to my bed and it'll sound great. So I've got the right microphone and I mean, it've got the right sound within my bedroom because it's all about singing, you know, for me and performing and writing. If you get an idea, sing it. And quite often those ideas that I've sung in bed with my dog snoring by the side of me, they made it. They made it to one of Todd Terry's tunes. And he, and it's like some some producers, they hear it. They hear the snow. But there's one, one I did with Todd. I won't say which one. But um, it was released and it's got definitely my Floyd, who's passed away now. Floyd's snoring on it. But um, it just, it's just it's a beautiful thing, I think, though, that... Um, you know, but it's, it's just so real because I just wrote it that one morning. I was in such a happy mood. And then when the tune's released, it's it's just a very real vocal. And you can't, quite often, you can't replicate that vocal when you go into a studio the same way. That very first time you have an idea and, you you know, when you do that first, if you're a good singer, no, it doesn't work. With, it, some people need a lot of work on the voice. But I can just sing down a good microphone and without any effects and stuff and it'll sound good. And I'm confident about that. And quite often that first take with its mistakes, which I love a bit of mistakes in this. I don't like perfect vocals. I like it to be real rather than perfect. And so a lot of those are used. And um, yeah, during lockdown, it was just blessed. It's like people like Youssef and we did a great tune during lockdown called When When Will We Be Free? Um, or When We Were Free. And he did this thing in Liverpool, the very first dance in Liverpool. Uh, I think it was the first dance in a lot of countries as well, where they tested it out without a mask. And the first tune he played was my tune with him when we were free and then he went into ultra Nate's free and it was Sorry, just this no. moment oh and then I, I didn't go because you had to live in liverpool to go i could have i could have sneakily gone in but i thought no i'm not going to do that to the people of liverpool i'm from manchester and then six o'clock in the morning yusuf sent me a video of myself and ultra Nate starting this with our tunes the first time people were able to dance to yusuf djing in his club circus and i just cried and cried and cried just because I was singing, when when will we be free again? Just and it was just a really heartfelt vocal that I wrote. I sent him. Normally I don't send acapellas out. I sent him the acapella, and he put the music around it. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is just beautiful. And he gave it this moment for us, and very very special. And that's that's it gives me a great feeling about the lockdown period and the COVID because that was written specifically for. Or how I was feeling at the time. I just thought we were never going to be free. Will we ever be free again? That was the words, you know. Are we ever going to be free again? And I didn't know if we were. And, yeah, no, as I say, um, I'm a strong woman, but that nearly broke me. Well, you made it. Nothing, that can yeah, we all make, we're all here. If you're here, not everybody did make it. And that's another, you know, well, you know I've, lost, I've lost people, as a lot of people have. I've got a brother who's not here anymore. He was, was in the Bahamas. Um, so it's, it's it's heartbreaking. It's been a terrible, terrible time for a lot of people. And there's people who don't think it's real. It's very real for me in my life. So, you know, um, not just because it's a lockdown. I've actually, you know, lost people I know. So, um, yeah, it's just, it's terrible. And there's been people who've not been able to make it because they couldn't live. You know, it got too too much for them. And, you know, so it's it's, it's been a really, really sad struggle. And, you know, and you think, I think, oh, we're lucky, but I really didn't feel like I was lucky this time. Usually I think I'm lucky because I'm a singer and you know, everybody else has it hard. But I just thought I would have loved to have just, you know, just done something, been, been a driver, been a, just done something where I worked in some kind of industry which I could get out and do something. Uh, but I, did, I didn't just sit and well, wait, my wait, 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 wait. Didn't your government yeah. say that all of you need to be retrained? If I remember correctly. Yes. <laughs> yes, have you seen it? Have you seen the guy who said it, Boris Johnson yeah. and, and his oh, government? Yeah. It's absolutely disgusting. He should be retrained because he can't do his job. But don't get me started. But um, no, it's absolutely disgusting. It's an because insult as well. When it's I an spoke, insult. I had the Freemasons on. I've had different people. And I've, I brought this up in other, other conversations. I said, but you all can be retrained. And they start laughing. To retrain to what? We've been doing this for over 30-something exactly. years. What are we supposed to do now? And it why should we anyway? Why should we re retrain? Because I am good at other other stuff. You know, and I, I wouldn't admit, but you'd be, we'd be also taking jobs off other people. If you're taking, you do, try to retrain to do another job. I could probably, I can build computers and things like that. But I, and I, I do what I do at home. And, I, you know, I could teach I could pretend to, pretend to teach people to sing because there's no way I can teach someone to sing like I do. But some people, they take a lot of money 
pretending to teach people to sing. I could have done that online and ripped people off. I'm not that kind of person. Um, <laughs> I've just blown it if everyone wants to be a singing teacher. No, but I, I go into schools and help people for nothing. It's my pleasure, but I do these things with BIM, um, which helps people who want to be in the industry. And we did a bit of that online, and you go into theatres, now we can, and speak to those. But you're actually giving them good advice on how, how to be wise and not take the first manager, not work with just everybody, not give your voice away. And so that's the sort of advice I do. But to um, retrain as what, as you say, I've, not, I've, I've paid my taxes for years, and this government has taken so much money from our industry how cheeky. I just never want to meet him. He's disgusting. He's, uh, he's disgusting. If he ever gets girlfriends, he's only got a pretty girlfriend because of who he is. He's disgusting. He's horrible. I just, and people do love him and I don't get it. I think it's because he's one, he's one of, he looks like he's one of the lads, you know, the way Trump did. And it's just, I don't get it personally. But um, I don't like doing politics at all and, and vote for who you want. But the mess we're in because of him. And, you know, yes, yeah, it's, it's insulting us when we're down anyway. You know, these people who went and killed themselves, let's be honest, because of this, retrain yourself and you're not getting any money because there's a lot of people who are excluded from getting any money. And then you've got young, rich kids getting grants. There were young girl singers getting grants, young white girl singers getting grants that I wouldn't have been able to get a grant. And it's like, probably, I mean, I wouldn't have asked. I'm one of them people who don't go and ask the government for money. You know, we haven't got young children at home to, to support. But I've spent all my savings during lockdown, like a lot of other people, believe me you know, on living, because I'm not, you don't get these that other people get. And then you get some rich kids getting grants of thousands of pounds. So that's what, what is happening here. And um, it's really annoying. But I'm still, now Now we're out of that situation and you don't have to retrain. <laughs> I'll retrain as a boxer and knock him out. <laughs> I just that's always thought it was, I just thought it was joking. I thought it was always quite funny when I heard, okay, let's say, let's retrain a whole industry. Uh, there's a picture of a ballet dancer and saying, I think we were trying to make out the ballet dancer should re retrain to be something else and with a picture of a computer or something. It's just pathetic. Instead of, that's also saying, retrain because we're not going to get out of this anytime soon. That's what it felt like. Why would you retrain if, this, if, it's, if we're going to get back soon? That's when we start to lose hope. And that... And um, unfortunately, that helps people decide to kill themselves. That's how disgusting it is. It's like, to me, it's like murder and it's manslaughter. But anyway, that's why I don't talk about politics because I've really got, I've got strong views, but it's not even who you vote for. It's just it's been a really terrible time. And it's when people make it worse for you. It's with no, with no, just no common sense to it. There's no reasoning. Why be so cruel? And it is cruel, you know, to everybody, you know, it, Anyway, now they're getting, and we still got to pay tax. You know, we still got to pay all our tax or whatever. They don't let us off for anything. I hate them. But in the, in the real world, normally, I think we're really, really well paid in this industry and we pay a lot of tax. So usually I wouldn't complain about much at all because we're lucky. You know, it's, it's the people who don't have great jobs that struggle. And I've been there as well. You know, I've been a single parent with nothing. In a, in a women's aid refuge, a lot of people in the UK know this. So I was in a women's aid refuge for five months with nothing at all, with two young babies. So I've been there and, you know, I do what I can to give back. So I can live on nothing because I've done that before. But why should people live on nothing? You know, it's not fair um, at all. You're too so damn anyway. talented. Listen, you're too damn talented to live on nothing. Come on. At this stage... No, but I, 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 no I'm saying... I'm saying you I can't to live on nothing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. When, when, I was, when I was a battered wife, I had to, but I was only 21. But really, I should have been doing well in my singing if it really by then. But you meet the wrong person, it can happen. I got through it, I moved on. And yeah, and you know, but I'm saying the way the government, if you can't work, you're going to have nothing. So it's, you know, I'm, I'm, I could, I'm not one of them girls who's going to go and marry somebody because they've got money. I'm not that kind of woman. I could have used oh. a load of men in my life. But I unfortunately, Ooh, it works the, way, it the other way around for me. People, people, I've been out with a lot of unemployed models, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rowena. Well, here we, go. here we go. Here we go. Because we want to get into... No, it's okay. It's all right. We want to get into the life story of you. So... Yeah, as no, I was joking then. That's okay. As I ask everyone, I'll ask you the same. How does music find you as a young kid? And then you could take us from there. You can take us on this, well, this journey. I, mean, I had it really bad when I was a kid because 
It's like, no, I didn't know I could sing. I didn't think I could sing. And, and nobody else thought I could sing as well. So when I'd sing along to anything, I wasn't encouraged. My mum would say, be quiet all the time. She didn't have a great music record collection at home. My dad left when, we, when I was about two or three, went back to Nigeria. So I was just stuck with, she did have Tony Bennett, I love. She had Tony Bennett album, Perry Como. So she had that kind of um, croony and smooth, really smooth, lovely, beautiful music. A bit of Motown, but not much. Um, so the other, so I, I never thought, oh, I want to be a singer. But then I went to join the choir and I sang probably an octave lower than the really high pitched singers. And it, I think it happened to Shirley Bassey as well, apparently, when she went to go in the choir when she was about eight same as me and you can't get in because you stand out too much and this kept happening to me when I was eight nine whenever I went to the nativity play when we're doing um a thing for Christmas there's we I'm not, I'm not Mary I'm just one of the people I'm, I'm, I'm a donkey or I'm the, one of the shepherdesses or something but um they're telling me asking me to mind because my voice stood out too much Instead of encouraging somebody who stands, I always look when I go into schools now, I try and find someone who stands out too much. And that's the one who's probably got this something that I would look for. Not the one who tries to sing ah, or do all the runs like Christina or uh, Mariah and does it not as good as Mariah. And not those. I want the one who just sings from the heart. So that's what I think I did. So I didn't get in the choir. And then, and honestly, my mum, every time I would sing, she would say, I'm watching TV. I'm listening to the radio. So no encouragement whatsoever. And then, um, yeah, and then I went to a really right posh school and uh, the school fees were high. So my mum got an extra job as a barmaid. And I, I, was, I sat upstairs, so I was 13, 12 or 13. And the lady upstairs, the landlady, she was dying of cancer. And she kept saying as I sang along, when I was sang along to the radio or the television, you've got a really good voice. Go down on the stage downstairs in the pub and sing. And I was like, oh, no, I can't. Everyone's always told me to shut up. And I went and sang on the stage. I didn't really know all the words to which, I think it was a K-Star song called The Wheel of Fortune. I think some, not a lot of people know. It's just one of my mum's records. And I sang that with um, an organ player and people stood up and screaming at me and people were getting goosebumps. I couldn't believe it. The reaction of people to this song that I, I didn't even properly know the way I wasn't thinking about. And I will never forget that feeling. And then I went into um, a talent competition and won um, in a holiday camp. And then I kept winning loads of talent competition. Every, I, I just, I didn't lose a talent competition for about three years. And then I lost to a whistler because he was in an Irish place and he whistled Danny Boy <laughs> really beautifully, he whistled like a bird. So, so I got, but that's the first time. You know, I, Irish people with their whiskey, you know, you dig, you sing Danny Boy, it's a done deal. You it, no, it was a whistler. It was a whistler. <laughs> wait, 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 you, Lolita Holloway, Whitney Houston, all together, you were lost with the whistler. I know, somebody whistling Danny Boy. And so it's like, got it, but I was, I was heartbroken because it was the first time I'd lost. And I thought, oh, I must, am I not as good as my confidence went? Because as I said, I've never been in, encouraged until but, uh, just strangers always told me your voice is special. There's something special about you. And I connect with people when I sing, when I come on, go on stage, I do, I just love it. I just get this feeling. I love the lyrics though. I don't think about too many people think about sounding like something. And I've always got to love the words first and it has to mean something. I've only, I've only recorded a couple of songs that I regret doing. I've written one of them. I think it was called Hey Mr. DJ, but it was just rubbish. You know, and I don't like throwaway songs. I don't really like Shut up your face, novelty songs. I don't like things like that. I like um, I like them to mean something, um, and if, or, or I've got to find a way of trying to make them, you know, feel like they mean something. Um, so um, yeah, I just fell in love with this thing singing, and it came from nowhere. Nobody in my family sings. Nobody's got any musical talent, as far as I know. My, and my dad in Nigeria didn't want me to do singing. He said it was it was like a bit degrading. He was a, a brilliant man. He was a politician. And yeah, he just wanted me to give it up. He got shot. He got assassinated in 1992. Whoa, um, whoa. Yeah. That's why we're hearing this political talk rhetoric. Oh, you have yeah, but I don't do politics. That's why we don't, I don't do no, politics. No, 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 I'm not saying, no, 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 I'm not saying about your views. I'm listening to how yeah. you're speaking. And I'm listening, yeah. going, this is not somebody who's, this is in your DNA, my dear. Now yeah, it makes yeah, sense. Because yeah. you know as well, you know, you said that my daughter, she's like, she's in her 30s now. 
but she got a degree in politics, first class honours degree in politics. I would never, ever do politics or want anything to do with politics. But as you say, it is, it, it's, it's about more about caring. You, you've got to do something. And that's what my dad was amazing at. And he unfortunately got assassinated. But they all said he was like President Kennedy, which I love because I love I love the whole but President how Kennedy. High of an office, how high of an office did he hold in Nigeria? He's called George Osaida, very high. He was up for, he was very high. I, I mean, it's, it's different over there. So I'm not going to, I'm going to say something. If there's any Nigerians there, I don't want to, it's, it was in Benin. You can Google it. He was very high and he was doing a speech. They said he was going to be like the new President Kennedy. And, you know, he was, was about 40 something. He was about 42, 44. Everybody, you know, they either loved him or not. And then because he looked like he was going to take over, he had a good chance. He was very high up. And he was a good person. He wasn't a great dad, but he was a, he was a great politician. And I loved him. I didn't even mind that he wasn't a great dad. He was just a wonderful and clever man. And um, I loved that he went on to do well in politics. It's just so sad that he got shot in 1992. And, oh, yeah, it's, it's heartbreaking for me when I think about it. But it, that's, that's how my life has been quite a lot. And... And yet he's just, you've just got to get on with it. You've just got to, he's, he's not a lot else to say, you know. I don't sit and say, oh, it's a shame for me. And at like the moment, I've just had to get over the loss of my dogs and it kills me. I know I don't handle death very well and my brother. And um, But I, I am good at just putting myself into me. As long as you're busy, that's why, you know, as long as you can keep busy, I have to do that. But there is a time, of course, you shut your doors and I don't put it into songs or anything like that. I just shut my, shut my doors and have a cry and think, I'm going to have a breakdown. And then I don't. I've got a bubbly personality. I've got a lot of friends, but I do need to switch off friends and, and life now and again because I've got a lot of heartbreak. But like everybody, you know. Sure, of course. It comes with the territory. And everybody yeah. grieves and everyone grieves differently. Yeah. You know, there is no right or wrong way of grieving. That's how of we, whatever you, to, to, it's a coping mechanism. Whatever it gets, is a coping yeah. Basically, whatever gets you through. If that means you call up your best friend, tell them to go f themselves, yeah, <laughs> or you have to yell it out. Whatever it takes. That's true. That's the way it goes. Yeah. So, you now, I got it. Your mom is Jewish, English. Yeah. Father's Nigerian. Yeah. So you have black. So you're being really considered mulatto in a sense. Um, I don't know what you're allowed to say anymore. <laughs> But my my mum's Jewish, my dad's Nigerian. Um, yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I honestly, I don't know what word you're allowed to say there, here, or anywhere else without offending somebody. Here, somebody's offended by every word you say. It seems so. I just, I don't know what I don't know. I'm, I'm. My, my dad's Nigerian, my mum's half and half. I'm half, I'm half black, half yeah, white. Half, that's what I mean. Sometimes you're frightened of saying half because there used to be a word that went with that when I was young, and also because of my age. There was a time when things were okay to say and didn't offend anybody. Oh, I know. This is just everything. Oh, this so has changed. But, we all say yes, this. It was. Uh, you, you, you kids, what, what was red before is now green, and that's not right. Yeah, you can't yeah. say green. It's yellow, yellow, I mean, blue. There's, there's some little little old ladies. So there's a little old lady. She came over from Ireland, I remember, my friend's grandma, and she said a wrong word in a video shop a load of years ago. And and somebody wouldn't let it go, you know, this black guy in the queue. And I was saying, she's just, it's just, she said the wrong word. I think she said the word coloured. And she didn't, you know, it, she's just an eight-year-old woman who's just come over from Ireland. She wasn't being offensive. That was the point. It's, it's what people mean when they say it. You know, I, I've got black children. I don't want them to, anybody to say bad words to them. But they have to get used to hearing them over the years. And my son has come home and he'd be playing the tunes of some of these American rappers. And I'm going, I think it's ludicrous. It's, oh, she's a hoe. And I'm in bed in the morning and the whole bed's throbbing. And I'm like, and I'm dying to say, turn it down. But I won't say turn it down because I'm a, a cool mum. And I'm never going to tell my kids to turn the music down. So I said, turn it up. And then he turned it down because he was throbbing. And the words, some of the lyrics, you think, oh, God, I hope he doesn't speak like that. I hope he doesn't get, you know, I hope he doesn't use the words in print, but he never, he doesn't, he never has done. He doesn't speak like that. He just loves oh, music. I know. It's, it's funny. It's, it's like a word you all use there, the C word. Yeah. I don't use that. Not you. Not necessarily you, I but you make a, lot of people, a lot of women use it here as well. If you say it on this side of the ocean, it's terrible. But over there. It's not terrible to me. I think it's terrible to me. But over but there, you hear it like it's, dang. I know. 
brother. I still think it's, I still think it's bad. bad I, 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 I wouldn't want any of my children saying it or being to be called it for a start. But um, yeah, no, I hate that, and I hate you know because a lot in the music because he, he was into DMX and all a lot of rap rappers and and I listen and Tupac I love and it was I just I used to listen to it through the bedroom walls. But some of it, the N word coming up a lot. I was just worried that he has to be careful if he starts talking like, but he never has, as I said, he just really liked the music, never quoted any of the music or the lyrics. So it's fine. You just have to hope that kids are sensible enough to enjoy a tune without going around saying, you know, some of the lyrics from it. But he got he got through, he got over it anyway. He's not into that music anymore. Um, or the gangs, you know, there was no gangs where we were, luckily, um, in this part of Manchester. I was very, very lucky. I'd kept him away from all that. So I was determined to because he, he had a different kind of life until I left his father. So I gave them a life where there's none of that, none of that. And they've turned out really, thank goodness, turned out very well. Good for you and good for what thank you have you. done because you kept everyone in. Well, it means I can go about and do my stuff now without worrying, you know, and do my career without worrying about them. They've got their own lives. They work hard. They're not into music, not in music, involved in music the same way. So, but um, music's a very hard industry to get into as well. I wouldn't recommend anybody does it unless they've got a real craving and love passion for it uh, especially more now than it was before oh, because before you can get in and now it's so different and so hard but everybody wants to be famous as well and it's that's and the so problem me, yeah it's, it's, it's whether they've got talent or not and it's how they look and they're, getting, they're all looking the same sometimes they're sounding the same and the social media it's sometimes it's how good they are on tiktok how good they are on this how many followers they've got on instagram and it's like it's not about the music and the djs I love the DJs of the superstars sometimes, but it's like, I have Hardwell, I've watched the videos of Hardwell coming on stage singing my song. And it's like, he's, he's wording my song when he plays when he plays my song at the beginning of Show Me Love. I don't get credited, as I say. But it, they don't need singers sometimes because you've got these DJs with these massive audiences and they're just doing this. And it's like, I, but it's a great, it's a great honour though. I'm very, very flattered. But it's just, it's... But I, you're being real. Listen, you're being real about it. It is what it yeah, is. it's it's a different world though. It used to be the DJs played the tunes and we just dance. But now a lot of the crowd they're looking up to the DJs. Literally, the DJs are on the stage instead of just playing the tunes. I like the clubs where, like in the house, you're in the booth, you didn't really see the DJs. I would go in the in the booth and see your Frankie Knuckles and Mike Pickering because I could because I was a singer and I'd get I'd be allowed to go in. But really, the DJs were away from. You'd look up at them, but you would be well. A lot of the people were off the faces, so they were just dancing off the faces. But as it should be in a club, really, not really just. Now a lot of the DJs, it's going to watch a gig. And I love that as well because I love watching Salado. But you do go and watch it. It's not, it's different than the clubs. It's more like a theatre now, um, watching the DJs on stage sometimes. It's, um, it's more of a performance where the DJs are the... Please search for part two of this podcast on the platform you're watching or listening to. And please do not forget to follow us.